Well, here we are back where we started. We started at the description of this big Cecil B. DeMille saga. Now we're at the end, and I want to review it again because this is the single most important thing for you to know for the whole chapter, is that acute inflammation is a sequence of events, a linear, logical sequence of events, a nonspecific response to a wide variety of stimuli resulting from a uh, resulting in a normal tissue shows showing vasodilatation then increased vascular permeability then leakage of exudate then margination rolling and adhesions of neutrophils which then diapedes or transmigrate through the wall of the vessel then being affected by a wide variety of stimuli to go to the area of uh, insult and become then activated to recognize the insult, attach to it, engulf it, and kill it by virtue of digesting it by releasing their powerful uh, granules uh, into it. The process is then done. The process then can come back to complete normal histology again, or it can heal with a scar or with chronic inflammation. And let's talk about these last two things now, fibrosis and chronic inflammation. First of all, just as neutrophils were the key cells of acute inflammation, mononucleated cells, in other words, lymphocytes with one round nucleus, or monocytes, macrophages, or histiocytes, they're all the same cells, folks, with kind of a round but a little bit bumpy nucleus, are the chief cells of chronic inflammation. So, what polys are to acute inflammation, monos are to chronic inflammation. And Often pathologists will use the term histiocyte rather than macrophage. Macrophage is probably more correct of a word, but most pathologists, especially the old-fashioned ones like me, uh, usually use the word histiocyte. We try to say macrophage, but they're the same cell. And by the way, monocytes are also the same cell as these other two, except when they are in circulation, they're called monocytes. When they're in tissue, they're called macrophages or histiocytes. What causes chronic inflammation? Well, one thing is persistence of the factors which cause acute inflammation. If the factors are still present, but the acute inflammation is reciting, re receding, then that can uh, persist as chronic inflammation and the monos will replace polys. If the uh, insult is still present or prolonged exposure, that's another cause of chronic inflammation. And last but not least, in autoimmunity, where the insults are your body's own antigens, is really one of the main causes of chronic inflammation as well. So most autoimmune processes histologically are uh, chronic inflammation, which is what? It's infiltration of monos into tissue. What are cellular players? We've already told you, lymphocytes and macrophages, or if you want to call them lymphocytes and histiocytes, that's the same thing. However, often uh, you'll see uh, plasma cells, eosinophils, or mast cells perhaps as part of the process, but remember, the cellular players in chronic inflammation is really a, could be a whole wide variety of things, with lymphs and macrophages being the main things. But in acute inflammation, the cellular player is only one cell, and that's the neutrophil. So the morphology of chronic inflammation, duh, it's the same as acute inflammation, except now we have monos infiltrating tissue and perhaps causing destruction and perhaps eventually healing rather than neutrophils of acute inflammation. 
Let's talk about the third type of inflammation. And even though there's more, let's just list the, the third type. Let's talk about granulomatous inflammation. In acute inflammation, neutrophils were the chief cell. In chronic inflammation, lymphocytes and macrophages were the chief cell. In granulomatous inflammation, granulomas are the chief infiltrating structures. What are granulomas? Granulomas are collections of macrophages or collections of histiocytes. That is the chief cell of a granuloma. Sometimes the uh, cytoplasmic uh, masses fuse and the nuclei are still present, so you see uh, multinucleated giant cells inside of granulomas. But for the most part, most of the cells comprising granulomas are free macrophages. Sometimes you'll get a little bit of stippling of uh, lymphocytes towards the periphery, and sometimes there'll even be some fibroblasts towards the edge. And the longer that granuloma is around, the more fibroblasts you'll see, and so-called healed granulomas in which you see uh, all fibrosis or perhaps calcification, uh, often non-infectious or long-standing uh, in healed granulomas, perhaps a fibroblast would be the chief cell. But don't get confused, folks. The chief cell of granulomatous inflammation are macrophages. Often, clinically, uh, the word granuloma could be differentiated into caseating and non-caseating. And caseating, as you remember, is a gross term because it cuts like cheese. But microscopically, caseating means necrosis. So if you see granulomas that are necrotic and they have necrotic features histologically, those can be called caseating. And if they are still composed of viable cells without necrosis, viable histiocytes, histiocytes or viable macrophages, those are non-caseating. And uh, remember, uh, caseating granulomas often are tuberculosis, and but not always. And non-caseating granulomas often are not tuberculosis. So that's the uh, significance of the word or the differentiation or specification or adjective of caseating when you talk about granulomas. I'm going to throw this in for a second because I want to show you that uh, the lymphatic drainage of inflammation, acute, chronic, granulomatous, or anything is the same as in tumors. It basically goes to the regional lymph nodes. I don't want to say anything more, but the uh, lymphatic vessels and the lymph nodes can be very activated and involved in the inflammatory process in the area of acute or chronic inflammation. Last but not least, here are some of the systemic manifestations of acute inflammation, fever, chills, C-reactive protein, acute phase reactants, which I'm going to show you, increase in erythrocyte sedimentation rate, whether you use the Wintrobe or the Westergren method, leukocytosis, neutrophilia, if you will, increase in pulse, increase in blood pressure, and the cytokine effects like fever, pain, and so forth, or in other words, all of the things that aspirin uh, is supposed to help treat. I'm going to show you the very last picture here now, and it's a serum protein electrophoresis of uh, somebody that is normal. Albumin is always the biggest, sharpest spike. Then you have a couple little hills called the alpha-1 and alpha-2 section. Then you have the beta peak, which is larger than alpha-1 and alpha-2. And then you have a broad gamma peak, which are your immunoglobulins. If you remember this as a normal SPE, then what you have to also remember, finally, is that in acute nonspecific inflammation, these thin or small or smallest alpha-1 and alpha-2 containing a wide variety of globulins, different types of proteins are not the smallest anymore, and they're usually bigger than either the beta or sometimes even the gamma. So in other words, when your two smallest hills in the mountain range are no longer the smallest, that's usually a pattern of acute inflammation. And that is the end of chapter two, inflammation, and I thank you very much.